I'll just tell you a little bit about him, but he took on this, this role. Um, he was the, the head of the International Franchise Association. He took on this role at the NRF in 2010. Uh, it is the world's largest retail uh, trade organization. Uh, he is the chief advocate for all of our businesses, more than uh, 3.6 million retailers and, and 42 million workers uh, in our industry and two and a half trillion dollars worth of sales. So a hefty responsibility. Uh, he has uh, done a terrific job of surrounding himself with an outstanding team uh, and with that team, uh, they have really begun to make an impact in Washington, D.C. with policymakers. It's, it's just, from, the, from what I remember three years ago to, to today, it's really night and day in terms of the impact, the messaging, uh, the, the, the credibility that the National Retail uh, Federation has today. And I really give Matt and his team 100% of that, uh, that, that credit for the, the, the accomplishments that that they have made. Uh, he serves on a number of boards and, and committees, uh, including the U.S. Chamber of Commerce uh, Committee of, of 100. Uh, he has a law degree from The Ohio State University. He has an MBA from Georgetown. He's a, a very thoughtful leader. Uh, we're lucky to have him at, um, at the National Retail Federation, and we're also lucky to have him here today. Matt. Thank you, Terry, and uh, good morning, everyone. So if, if the, this is the single greatest accomplishment during your tenure as chairman of the board, you can take that one of two ways. Either you didn't do very much, <laughs> or this was really smart. So I, I hope it was really smart. I'll take that one. Um, but it, this, is, this is an exciting day for the National Retail Federation, and we think uh, for the entire retail industry, because we're making a major announcement today about the launch of a new campaign that, that uh, we think is really groundbreaking, um, that we think really reflects the last slide that Joe had up there about uh, the way in which the retail industry has been transformed, not going all the way back 2,000 years, but just in the last decade, in the last five years, and how much it will change again in the future, and the way in which we need to change uh, what people think about the retail industry uh, if we're gonna be effective at representing it um, in, in a very compelling way. So uh, before I get into the details of the campaign, let me just set up a little bit of context for you. Um, as, as Terry said, the National Retail Federation is the largest corporate trade association that represents retailers, uh, many of whom are represented in this room. Um, so we've got corporate members that range from department stores and discount stores and home goods, uh, chain restaurants, supermarkets, really everything you can imagine all the way down to single unit, uh, five person employee, one location retailers uh, that make up 95% of the retail businesses that exist in this country. So we really have everything from the very largest to the very smallest. And, and that kind of diversity gives us the ability to tell a story uh, in a way that really no other industry can tell. When you think about the things that the retail industry does, uh, again, as uh, Joe alluded to a minute ago, and I will in a few minutes, uh, the way we serve communities uh, and the other things that we do that really drive value for customers and that experience, the relationship that we have uh, is unlike the relationship that any other kind of business has w really with its customers. And, and so three years ago when, when Terry was the chairman of the board and, and I came on and there were a number of other great executives um, on our executive committee and board, we started to have this conversation about how do we do our job, how do we tell this story. And, and here, th this is really the perfect place uh, to be talking about that because this week's theme is accelerating your brand uh, and staying ahead of your customers. And so you all know what that means for retail companies, but what does that mean for a corporate trade association in Washington, D.C. with 10,000 member companies and a staff of 100 and a $45 million budget? What the heck does that mean for us and, and why is this relevant? Well, you know, for us, our brand is brand retail. I mean, that's our job. Our job is to protect the brand of retail for all of our member companies, for the whole industry. Uh, and our customers are the people that have perceptions about what we do and for whom we do it and the ways in which we do that um, and why that's important to the decisions that they make. So our customers are the people on Capitol Hill, policymakers, regulators, the folks in the administration at departments and agencies. Um, our customers are the media, 
and some are here today. More will be here tomorrow. I know CNBC is going to be broadcasting live. Um, and of course, our customers uh, are retailers themselves. And so when we started this journey three years ago, we started to talk about how we educate people about who we are and what we do and for whom we do it and why it matters to them when they make their decisions about what bills to write uh, on Capitol Hill or vote for, what regulations to implement, what stories to put up in the press. Um, and for retailers, you know, and I'll just I'll be selfish and say, you know, where should we put our resources? Where should we invest dollars? Where should we invest staff? Where should we invest our time? We want it to be with the National Retail Federation because they're our customers. And we realized that there wasn't a good understanding of the role that the retail industry played in the economy. No one really knew in the aggregate what the retail industry did. How many businesses were there? Terry alluded to that number. How many jobs were created? Uh, what kind of GDP impact that had? So we took all of this information from department stores and discount stores and home goods stores and supermarkets and chain restaurants, everyone that we could get, and we did a study, PricewaterhouseCoopers did this study for us, found that 42 million Americans, one in four jobs in this country, are jobs in the retail industry. That's nearly 20% of this country's gross domestic product. No one had ever done that before. It hadn't ever been undertaken. And that gave us the ability to walk in to the member of Congress's office or talk to their staff or talk to the media and say, listen, look what we do for this country in terms of our economic impact. And that gets people's attention. And then they understand 42 million jobs matter, particularly um, in 2010, still, you know, the unemployment rate is still unconscionably high and we have to do more and we will do more to lower that rate. But that got people's attention. But after a while, people started to say, okay, so you create a lot of jobs. That's great. But, but so what? What kinds of jobs do you create? And so we realized that we had raised our awareness and people knew more about who we were and what we did and the economic impact, but we hadn't solved the question of the perception about the retail industry. And we all know what we think about retailing and we know why we love it and why we're all here today. Um, and it's not all because you, we were all hired by Terry. Most of you are in this room because you really love it for other reasons too. And you're gonna be in that industry forever, hopefully when you get out of school. But we did a video that I think we should run now that kind of gives you an idea of what we all know about retail, but what all people don't know and they need to know about what we do. So, so that video starts to, I think, capture the energy uh, that we all feel about what the retail industry is. And we all know that, and we all experience it every single day. And, and we know that it's more than uh, the sales associate in the store. The sales associate in the store is critical, and lots of us had jobs like that uh, and still do. I certainly did. That was my first job when I was a 15-year-old kid as a stock boy and then a shoe salesman and then a suit salesman at a department store in my little hometown, but, but most people don't know there's more to it than that. They don't know this and they don't feel this. And so as we started to have the discussion about how many jobs we created and the economic impact that, that resulted from what we did and what all of you did for the people you served, we realized that the awareness was getting better, but our brand really had an image problem. People didn't understand what the brand stood for and why the brand mattered a lot. And with that, we conceived of this campaign, This Is Retail. And the driving components of This Is Retail are careers, communities, and innovation, because those are the things that are relevant to people in today's workforce. Those are the things that are relevant to the customers that are coming into your stores today and the people that are gonna serve those customers. And we built this entire campaign 
around this is retail. And, and the point of the campaign really is to dispel the myths that exist. So to continue in, in a more sophisticated way the conversation we're having with our customers, uh, with those people on Capitol Hill, the folks in so-called inside the Beltway in Washington, and with the media, uh, and with students, uh, and with retailers about why these jobs are so critical in our economy, and not just for the sake of doing that, but by improving our image, we're gonna have greater success at attracting the talent we need to make our businesses more successful and to grow our businesses and to become more profitable. And we're gonna have more success, we believe, on Capitol Hill in advancing our agenda, talking to regulators, talking to state legislators, whoever that might be, because when they're trying to make a decision, they never have all the facts. It's impossible to, to think that they ever could. So at the end of the day, they're sort of weighing competing interests one against the other. And if they think that there's another industry or another set of priorities that are more important than ours, because they have a blind spot about ours, or they have a misperception, or we have an image problem, then the decision they're going to make is probably not gonna go in our favor. But if we enhance the image of our industry, what we do, why we do it, why it's important, that's gonna translate, we believe, into more success on the things uh, that matter most to us. So as we launch this campaign that's gonna take place over the course of the next year, we're gonna be devoting significant resources, financial resources, time, attention. Uh, it launched today, so this is the perfect place for us to do it because of the relationship with the students that are here and the opportunity to speak to them uh, in a way that really matters about the careers that they'd like to have. But this is a, a, a really a media blitz that's taken place on Capitol Hill, across the country, in the national media, and it's gonna continue uh, over the course of the next year, and it's got uh, a number of elements that will uh, ensure that it's sustainable, uh, that we continue to keep this at a very high level and have people's attention. Um, and one of the, I think the most interesting of those is we'll be conducting a lot of uh, very timely original research to go back out to the market uh, and ask the people that we're trying to influence and ask those that are in the industry what they think about the campaign. And, and before we launched this, we did just that. We did a, a, a very robust survey and there are a number of uh, results of the survey that I think sort of give you an understanding of, of why we're taking this in the direction we are and why it's so important. Um, because as, as we asked these young people um, about what mattered most to them, we, we realized that, that this group, these millennials or the generation wires, um, really wanted, among other things, to have their opinions heard. They wanted to have their decisions implemented and, and <laughs> Not so an old guy, you know, when you're 50, you can say this, all oh, those kids. Um, they want to manage and own their own projects, but they want to do all this in their first job. I mean, and, and, and we heard some of these great stories last night, and I was listening to these students last night, and it was just, it was almost, it was like a tragic comedy to me because um, I was sitting there thinking about what I was doing when I was 21 or 22 years old, and these polished, poised, uh, very accomplished young people come up and they're talking about the projects they worked on and they've got jobs lined up and every one after the other and they weren't all, you know, lots of the 37 were, were his, but uh, lots of them were these other great retailers and you're thinking, how did they do that? Um, that's the difference between this generation and that one. But that's why we've gotta have a different approach to the way we tell our story. We can't just say 42 million jobs, one in four in America, 20% of GDP. That's not a compelling reason for these people and, and, and for these young people, and that's not really a compelling reason for your customers either, and, and it's not gonna translate for retailers and for the NRF into success on those things that are the most important to us uh, with some of those key audiences. So the goal is to dispel those myths, um, to put out real facts about who we are, what we do, how we do it, why this is so relevant, um, and, and the place in which we really start this conversation is talking about careers. Uh, careers uh, is something that many people don't think of when they think about the retail industry. They, they, they think about a first job that then leads to something else. Uh, but they don't necessarily think of the retail industry as one where there are lifelong careers. And you know this whole notion of uh, having your opinions heard um, and having ownership of projects right from the start, the, the terrific thing about the retail industry is not only is it possible, it's really expected. 
in, in lots of businesses. I mean, young executives get experience right from the very beginning in ways that, that doesn't exist uh, anywhere else. And, and Terry's talked before about the sort of the breakfast club of, of these, new, uh, these new generation folks that he gets together with on a regular basis. There are lots of examples of that. We had uh, a terrific example just earlier this year uh, with a, a 26-year-old uh, woman, an executive at Wet Seal, uh, who came in as, a, uh, as, a, as an auditor um, and, and co-store manager. And just in three years, she's achieved this level of accomplishment inside the company that she's now sitting with on a regular basis the C-level executives talking about how they map out their strategy to reach the customers because she presented herself in such a way that, that she was virtually indispensable to the discussions that they wanted to have and needed to have. And she took on more and more responsibility and they gave it to her. And the more she took on, the more they gave her. And that was one of the reasons in January at our convention that she won one of the scholarships, uh, one of the really the, uh, the foundation keynote scholarships we give to these high achieving students because they're out there um, and they found that, that they can take advantage of the opportunities that exist uh, in retail in ways you can in, in other industries. And uh, you know, I think that raises a, another really important point about the retail industry that is so compelling uh, for this next generation that speaks to the issue of, of careers specifically. Uh, and that is that both the, the barriers to entry in the retail industry are very low as an employee because by definition you can get in, you can get a lot of responsibility, you can make an impact right from the start. And it really is a meritocracy. Un unlike so many other places where you could start a career, it's easier in the, in the retail industry in relative terms to actually achieve those dreams inside the company than it is in, in far, uh, far more industries. And there are lots of examples. There are examples in this room. There are examples on our board. Uh, you know, Karen, Karen Katz of Neiman Marcus started out um, on the sales floor in Dallas, and she got that job, first job out of school, and that was after they'd rejected her once. I mean, now she's the CEO of the whole company, and she'd applied for the job and been turned down, and she didn't give up, and she went back, and she got the job. Um, Carol Meyerowitz of TJX Companies, same thing, started as a buyer, is now the CEO. And, and, and I think one of the persons on our executive committee that really drove this home for us and did a terrific job earlier this year uh, with the student group at our foundation meeting in, in um, January at our big show was Jim Wright, who's the outgoing CEO of Tractor Supply and now executive chairman. And Jim was the one, I, I think, um, and I see Terry nodding, Jim was the one that, that really, in, in a very crystal clear way, talked about um, you know, his own experience and, and said, you know, the beauty of the retail industry is it is this meritocracy and anything is really, truly achievable and possible for you if you dedicate your career uh, to retail and if you really devote yourself to it because you can make that happen. Um, so one of the things that I think people don't also think about is the breadth and the diversity of the jobs that exist uh, in the industry. And that goes back to the observation about everyone thinks about the sales associate. That's what we see. That's what we think about. Um, obviously, there's far, uh, far more to it than that. Um, this first data point I'll share with you, um, I'll be interested in your reaction. There are, I guess it depends on where you sit. There are 46,000 uh, auditors and accountants that work full-time as employees of retail companies, not as outside folks, but 46,000 full-time auditors and accountants. Now, that, that's something that most people wouldn't think uh, when they think about retail, that you could have a career as an auditor or an accountant, but you could be part of a retail business. You, you might have your own opinions about whether that's good, there are so many auditors and accountants, but lots of people might think that was a terrific thing. Um, there are 25,000 uh, computer programmers that work in the retail industry. And, and that's another one where most people wouldn't think, well, if I want to be a computer programmer, I've got to go to Silicon Valley and I've got to work for a technology company or a startup. Most people wouldn't think, well, you can do that at a retail company. And, and that goes to another dimension uh, of retail that we'll talk about in a minute. And then the, the last one of these I think most people would never think of is there are 2,600 uh, animal trainers and animal handlers in retail businesses. So I don't know if, you know, we saw some of those at the, when Terry ran his video and the parade and there's a bunch of those, uh, but where are they all? I don't know, but, but who, who thinks that you could be an animal trainer and have a career? You think of Jack Hanna at the San Diego Zoo. Nobody thinks about retail businesses. Um, and it, that just speaks to the diversity of, of things you can do uh, 
um, in, in retail that makes this uh, so compelling for so many folks. So when we talk about retail, 42 million jobs is absolutely critical. That's the, you know, if you're playing poker, that's the ante to get into the game. We have to tell that story. We have to tell it often uh, and consistently. But, you know, it's not only about that. Retail doesn't only mean jobs. It, it means careers. Uh, the other thing that we know that the best and the brightest that are coming out of school today and, and those that are going to be in school and going to be your employees of the future and your customers, what they care about is they care about giving back to their communities. Uh, that is absolutely a critical part of the DNA of this next generation. Uh, and our survey results bore this out, that, that this is the kind of thing without which um, the possibility of a lifelong career alone is not going to be compelling enough for many of these young people because they're going to say, yeah, a career is terrific, but if you don't have this element too, I'm not interested because there are other places where I know I can do both and I'm going to keep looking for that uh, until I can find it. The, the survey data showed that commitment to community and social responsibility is one of the top three factors uh, and one in four young adults told us they want to work for a company whose values match their own, uh, that they really want to be somewhere and that gets back you know, and that's good for retail, that gets to the issue of the seamlessness between the workplace and the home. You don't know where one starts and one begins next, and that's the same experience retailers have with their customers. They're dealing with them all the time, wherever they are, however they want it, however she wants to get it, that's what happens. The same is true of this, this phenomenon, that that community piece, they want to be able to take that with them from their own lives straight into the workplace and straight back, interchangeably, seamlessly. And, and that's something that the retail industry can deliver like no one else uh, can deliver. And we all know and have heard terrific, wonderful stories, and every retailer in this room has one about their national charity causes and their local charity causes uh, and the things they do. Um, Kip Tyndall of the Container Store, the founder and chairman of that board, is on our executive committee. And his distribution center in Dallas in December uh, adopted a Make-A-Wish uh, local charity, and they granted 100 wishes for, for young people there. Uh, there are stories like that everywhere. You know, after Superstorm Sandy hits, um, you know, Walmart sends 7,000 generators up to the Northeast to power homes and to power businesses and to power hospitals and, and help first responders. And they send all the personnel necessary to get all that put, put together and hooked in. Lots of other of the, of the Northeast companies did similar kinds of things. That kind of stuff happens all the time. And retailers really are embedded in those local communities. But it's not only in times of disaster uh, or at certain times of the year because it's the holidays um, that retailers are serving communities. And it's not only at those times of the year that young people, these folks we're trying to reach uh, and help us tell this story about retail, that's not the only time they want to be uh, engaged in, in communities as well. And, and other retailers are really starting to adopt this. And Joe stole one of mine when he talked about Lululemon and, and, and he showed the pie chart and how important community is. Um, but their CEO, Christine Day, says that community is the number one priority for that company. And it's not uh, product or merchandising or omni-channel, but when you ask her what's her number one priority for the company, she says the number one priority for our company um, is community. And if you've been in a Lululemon, and I, I don't uh, wear a lot of uh, yoga pants, I will confess I'm not in there as a customer as much as I go in with my wife who is a customer, but you can see the, you can see the community. You walk by the front of the store in Georgetown and you can see that there's a group of people there that feel very, very connected to that. And there are young people want to work in an environment in which they have that opportunity because it's, it's a way in which they stay connected to their personal priorities, but yet they're serving their employer at the same time. Uh, and that makes that a, a, a greater level of connectivity, and we think those make for better uh, employees. So whether it's charitable giving, whether it's serving local communities at certain times of the year, uh, whether it's this constant sort of 24-7 community experience that exists uh, in some retailers, the community aspect uh, of this is retail is going to be a key component as we speak this year because that dimension helps flesh out this image that we're trying to create uh, of who retailers are and what they do uh, and for whom they do it. And then the last one is, is one that Terry talked about a lot, Jonathan talked about earlier, um, and it's really embedded in everything today. And we've got plenty of um, 
uh, some strategic partners that are here whose business is built around this, and that is innovation. And, and you know, again, that's one where um, when people think about retail, and we walk around on Capitol Hill, or, or we talk to some of the uh, less well-informed members of the media who aren't as um, confronted with this on a regular basis, they would never associate the word innovation with the word retail. They, the, the two just wouldn't go together for them. Now, you know, that, that for a moment forgets that they're customers of retailers too, and they must experience social media, and they must use their handheld devices, and they must be uh, participating that way. But people sort of turn that off, and when they think about retail, they ignore that. They, they don't think of it as an, as an industry that innovates. And that's the third leg of this stool for this generation and for the audiences that we're trying to reach, uh, in addition to careers and communities, is really innovation. Because if you're not innovating and your industry is not perceived as one that is uh, ascending but is rather perceived as descending, then you're going to lose the conversation from the beginning. Uh, no one wants to be part of, associated with, uh, work for, or serve uh, a descending enterprise. People want to be part of something that's headed in this direction. And the trend line for the retail industry is clearly headed in this direction based on the innovation that all of us know about and all of you see and experience and use every day in your businesses. But that's a story uh, that we've got to do a better job of telling. Uh, and, and there are lots of examples there. Um, Amazon is the one everyone talks about, but leave that one aside and call it, uh, for the moment, uh, a different kind of an experience. And just talk about the things that, uh, that we heard already today. Um, and think about the ways in which retailers are creating new relationships or trying to be uh, disruptive in the application of technology, uh, the convergence that exists, that seamless experience, the recognition, uh, finally, sooner for some others, market leaders, than others, that you have to have uh, across all the platforms, across all the channels, you have to have this complete fidelity uh, of the brand. And it's got to be exactly the same all the time, wherever you are, uh, because that's what your customers want. That's about innovation and the application of technology. And that's an important component of, of how we tell this story that, uh, that our young people want uh, and that we know that the graduates of, of the Lundgren Center here at the University of Arizona uh, rank very, very highly as they think about their careers and where they're going to go. Uh, and frankly, why their companies want them in the first place, because their generation already sensitized to this and a generation that brings that experience when they walk in the door uh, from the first day. So as, as we tell the story about careers and about communities uh, and about innovation, uh, it, it's something that we think is going to reshape uh, the dialogue. And, and I got a number of emails sitting here uh, just this morning. And because of the, the difference in time, this uh, somehow the staff got ahead of us and they're already, the press releases are out and people in Washington are covering this story and the big campaign's already been announced and it's in Politico and people are talking about the retail industry launches. So the cat is out of the bag um, and we have a terrific, wonderful story to tell that we're gonna be telling uh, in our own way across all those platforms. I was gonna say in an omni-channel way, but I can't steal Terry's, but we're gonna be omni-channel too and, and we have to be, so we're gonna be um, tweeting and, and uh, Twittering and Facebooking and um, you can tell I'm a, I'm a regular user. I see the staff as they're going, oh, we should have never let him get up there now. He doesn't know this stuff. He does know it. He embraces it. And, 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 um, and that, we're going to be everywhere the customers are that we're trying to reach. And uh, in telling this story, uh, you know, they say, I'm sure in lots of places, but especially they say in Washington, that both message and messenger matter. And we have terrific messages and wonderful stories to tell. And we can tell them to the best of our ability on behalf of the people that we serve in the retail industry. But the best messengers for the story that we have to tell are the people that live it every single day, the retailers, the students, the young people, the entrepreneurs, and so our goal is to get everyone engaged in that conversation and to start with people like those that are here this week, like all of you, and ask for you to help us as we start this conversation because it'll be so much more powerful and it's going to resonate and it will be uh, so much more compelling if you're helping us tell it uh, in the first person rather than us telling it uh, on your behalf. 
so let me finish uh, by showing you a quick video um, that we think sort of brings to life the campaign of this is retail and careers, communities, and innovation. That is, that is retail, that's a little slice of it, and in 30 seconds we can't do justice uh, to the story that needs to be told and the story that you can help us tell. But if you'll go to the website, this is retail, we've got thisisretail.org, we've got thisisretail at nrf.com, and we'll ask you to help us tell the story, and we are gonna be back to you regularly throughout this year, and this is gonna be one of those campaigns. Uh, I believe that you won't be able to turn off because we're not gonna let you turn off. We're gonna to continue to bombard you and, and the audiences that we need to reach because that's the brand um, that, uh, that we serve and these are the customers we're trying to reach and we'll be doing that uh, for the course of this year. So thank you for the opportunity to be here and talk about that this week and I hope you all have a terrific uh, rest of the conference. Thank you. I, but I'm, getting the high, I'm, get, I'm not getting the high sign, I'm getting the, sure, if you want to take a question, uh, you may, if there is a question. Um, I see a microphone. Oh, I see some hands, okay. Hi, Matt. Um, I think this would be a great shot in the arm for the industry's reputation. Uh, so much of what you said today were about retail jobs that tend to be focused on, um, I guess, the headquarters. And I wanted to ask you about how NRF might be spreading this message to the hinterlands, where um, I know a lot of the chains that are represented here struggle to find really strong talent to manage stores outside of the largest cities. That's also a very compelling career opportunity for people throughout the country. Uh, is that part of the message? And if so, how are you addressing? Yeah, the, 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 and so I don't know if everyone heard the question, but it was uh, beyond sort of the opportunities that exist to be in the headquarters um, at, at retailers. How do we get out to uh, both smaller retailers and, and the uh, distribution points of those large retailers outside the headquarters? Uh, and we're doing that in a number of ways. W one, of course, is um, social media tends to give us that opportunity to be in lots of places. Last year, we did a campaign, um, a video contest called This Is Retail, and that was really how we conceived of this campaign in the first place, as we asked the question about, um, uh, of, of small businesses and others, how we tell the story of the job creating aspects of retail. We said, do a two minute video, submit it, and tell us how, uh, in your own opinion, in your own experience, um, you've experienced career, community, or innovation. Uh, in what you do every day. And we had more than a thousand entries. They came from all over the country. We had governors and members of Congress tweeting about why we should vote for uh, someone that was in their district or from their state. And that really gave us the germ of the idea to do this broader campaign. So uh, we know we can get it out that way. Uh, we also have a very robust partnership with the uh, state retail associations. Uh, there are retail associations um, that do exactly the same thing that the NRF does uh, in individual states. Uh, and in many cases, they do it better than we do. They're obviously closer to their customers in the sense that they're right in the state with, with retailers at the local level. Uh, the chairman of the, of the state retail association executives, Michelle Almer, is here. And she happens to be from uh, Arizona. So it was a convenient place for her to be. And I don't know if she's still here yet. She's She's waving, she's standing, there's Michelle. So, so that's the other way we're doing it. Is we're, and then we're working with retailers who are pushing this out themselves uh, in places. And, and then I guess the fourth and last, I would say our foundation relationships through the schools and the universities uh, around the country that, that both have retail schools and have an interest in retail curriculum. We're working with them very closely as well. So we're trying to get it out every way we can. But if there are other ways that we haven't thought about and you want to share those with us, 
we'd be delighted to have your thoughts and, and uh, comments about that because there's um, no place we don't want to be. Um, I have a question regarding the um, generating the user generated content for the retail um, I guess, initiative. And I'm a student currently, and um, I, I can relate definitely to these uh, millennial values that you're speaking of. And um, this is news to me, you know, this, this massive uh, media outreach, you know, for everyone. And how do you plan to fully leverage this user-generated content in order to completely engage, um, especially university students, coming right into the workforce and really trying to gain that community experience that innovation experience that you know they quite they haven't quite tapped into yet. So how are we going to take advantage of all the user generated? So all these great stories that people tell us through all these various media that exist, and we get them. How are we going to use them to harness them in, in support of our activities? Uh, so a lot of it's going to be uh, redistributed through existing NRF channels. Uh, one big way we do that is at our annual convention in January. Uh, so we'll be doing that at that show and the various other uh, conferences and conventions that we do throughout the year. Uh, we've got a very robust media program, a communications team. So we do paid advertising in some places, but obviously we love uh, earned media more. We love the, the stories that get written um, based on the conversations we have with uh, the people that cover the retail beat or the business beat or the careers beat. So that's another angle uh, that we'll be pursuing. And then we're going to be launching a number of grassroots programs. So some of these stories, uh, as we did with the, uh, the This Is Retail video award winners, um, those were folks that won awards. We, we asked them uh, to come to Washington. Uh, we invited them. They came to Washington. We took them to Capitol Hill. We did lots of local press uh, back in their home states or in their home districts and their towns. So I think, again, uh, as with the, the previous observation, there are lots of ways that we'll be doing that. Um, and we feel very confident that we're going to get a tremendous amount uh, of, of, of really good uh, user-generated content that we're going to be able to then turn around. And, and back to the message and messenger matter, you know, it's better for you to be telling that story about retail than for us to take the story and try to retell it ourselves. So we're going to want to put that, those stories that come from you and others, we'll put them right out front and center wherever we can. So get ready to go to Capitol Hill. You're signed up. You're a lobbyist. Don't tell your mother. She thinks you're a piano player in a saloon. Um, that's the old joke. My mother, we won't go there. It's a clean joke. It's a clean joke. OK, any, any more questions? Because it's, it's lunchtime, I know. It's been a terrific morning. And uh, again, thank you um, to the University of Arizona Lundgren Center. We appreciate being here. Martha, thanks very much.